We've known for quite a while now that time is very inconsistent and perhaps even broken in the world of Little Nightmares. Clocks display radically different times even when in the same room, and causality appears to be reversed in some places, like the doctor shedding what might be soot before being burned in the furnace. But nowhere does still follow a certain consistency in the form of cycles. And though each cycle is different, they share a number of eerie similarities that may reveal a bit more about how this strange dimension really works. So let's take a closer look, starting with the first game. The Ma is run by the lady, who carefully maintains the large vessel as it drifts through the dark ocean, trawling giant nets behind and belching acrid smoke from a single chimney at its crest. And once per year, at the same time but never at the same place, it rises up to receive a group of guests. The lady welcomes these visitors, offering them an all-you-can-eat buffet, a chance to eat and drink as much as they can stuff into their faces, and in return they give her their bodies and souls. She has near-absolute control over those within the watery giant, and the events of each year are predictable. Everything makes sense. But there is trouble afoot, as a little girl in a yellow raincoat threatens everything and must be stopped at any cost. This does not come as a surprise to the lady, however. She knew this was coming all along because she, too, was once a little girl in a yellow dress. This picture found in her bedroom is her own self-portrait. We see how vain the lady is, how obsessed she is with herself, so it makes sense that the only image she would want displayed in her most private room is her own. Though never named in the game, I believe this lady is five, and there were four other ladies of the Ma before her as shown by this picture of the lady surrounded by four shadows. And just as she consumed the previous Lady Four long ago, the same fate was destined to be hers. Against all odds, Six does indeed make her way to the top of the Maw, successfully defeating and consuming Five to obtain her power. The last thing we see is Six climbing to the very peak of the Great Vessel, as if to sit on the throne of her new empire, gazing out over the lapping waves that will forever be her home. Before long, she will be the one wearing the dark robes. It will be her picture hanging on the bedroom wall, and one day her time will finally run out when Seven comes to replace her. Moving on now to Little Nightmares 2, we can see a very similar pattern in the way things play out. The signal tower is run by the Thin Man, who broadcasts all manner of captivating television programs out to the inhabitants of the Pale City, providing a welcome escape from their dreary lives. All he asks in return? Their bodies and souls. He has near-absolute control over those within the rainy metropolis, and in the chaos, there is stability. But there is trouble afoot, as a young boy in a tan trench coat threatens everything and must be stopped at any cost. The Thin Man knew this was coming, however, because he, too, was once a young boy in a tan trench coat. The number six on his door suggests there were at least four others before him. Now, there is obviously a time loop of some kind happening here, and evidence to suggest that Mono and the Thin Man are one and the same. But regardless of whether there were six different children or one child six different times, the outcome is the same. The Thin Man is destined to be replaced, and no matter how thoroughly he searches, no matter how many children he snatches away, this fate cannot be altered. Against all odds, Mono survives the horrors of the Pale City and stands tall, defeating and consuming the towering broadcaster to obtain his power. Following a sequence of events I'll circle back to later, Mono eventually ends up at the heart of the signal tower to grow taller and lonelier in equal measure, until the day his time inevitably runs out. So, why does the world work this way? My theory is that these powerful adult figures are replaced in cycles because nowhere feeds on the cycle of generational trauma. In my previous video, I explained how each part of Nowhere is based on a specific, unfulfilled need corresponding to Maslow's hierarchy, and this theory takes that idea a step further. In the observed cycle of generational trauma, toxic behaviors including various types of abuse and neglect are passed down from one generation to the next because children subjected to this poor treatment are at measurably higher risk of perpetuating the same behaviors as an adult. And once the cycle has begun, it can be very difficult to break due to how deeply rooted it becomes in an individual's or family's life. This is an important and sensitive topic, and if you're interested in learning more about it, I've linked a handful of useful sources in the video description below. Anyways, the point I'm trying to make here is that the cycles of nowhere closely mirror this cycle of trauma in the waking world, with plenty of evidence to suggest a correlation. First, and most importantly, is the ferryman's dialogue from Chapter 6 of the Sounds of Nightmares podcast. As Noon prepares to cross the threshold, he gives her a cryptic explanation of what to expect, starting with... Spoils white within. 
these innocent children at the very cusp of blooming into adolescence are uprooted from their world to seek spoils in another. This line is followed by... A world as wide as the deep, and narrow as the well. Nowhere is a massive place as wide as an ocean, but narrow because only an incredibly small number of children will actually obtain the spoils promised ascension, or usurping the adult oppressors of the world. This idea is perfectly illustrated by a piece of concept art from the Little Nightmares DLC, a wall covered in portraits all converging into a single portrait of the lady, both wide and narrow in equal measure. And finally, when Noon asks the ferryman if Otto can cross with her, he replies, Too long in the tooth, I feed the spectrum's other end. In this world, children suffer terribly at the hands of adults, only to someday replace them to perpetuate the cycle, a distorted reflection of the cycle of trauma in the waking world. In this context, the word spectrum applies to the human process of growth from childhood to adulthood, and the ferryman can only supply the front end, for only children have the potential to bloom. When viewed through this lens, some puzzling aspects of nowhere start to make more sense. For example, why does the lady appear to love dolls when she clearly has no regard for actual children? Well, it's been observed that when people experience significant trauma during childhood, their psychological growth can be stunted and they may keep childlike habits as an adult, like perhaps retaining an affinity for dolls. Now, while the ferryman wasn't technically lying about the spoils in Nowhere, he did oversell them a bit. The rare few children who grow to adulthood do indeed attain immense power and control, but they are never actually happy. As witnessed by the runaway kid, the Lady of the Maw is tormented by her appearance, or at least her perceived appearance. She sees only a hideous face looking back at her in the mirror, perhaps reflecting the true monster she has become, and takes care to hide it behind an elegant mask whenever she leaves her private residence. We can be reasonably sure that this bothers her because the lady otherwise seems obsessed with beauty. Her chambers are filled with mirrors, mannequins, self-portraits, and statues in her own likeness that convey this vanity. Interestingly, the lady of the prison, whom I've decided to call the warden for now, and the perfect lady of the workshop also appear to be obsessed with beauty and might share the lady's pain in this regard. True to her moniker, the perfect lady is described by Noon as wearing a beautiful dress with hair too shimmery, lips too wet, and eyes too glossy to be real. And as for the warden, Noon describes her face as being equally old and young, her skin stretched back tight, and her mouth filled with blackened teeth. An interesting choice of words. Not black, but blackened, as if they were not always this way, which evokes the custom of ohagoro practiced in feudal Japan and other Asian and Oceanic cultures. For centuries, women would dye their teeth black as a mark of beauty and maturity, and it only fell out of fashion at the turn of the 20th century when Western beauty standards had been introduced to these regions. Since the Ma and Pale City clearly reflect the architecture and customs of Japan, it seems reasonable for the prison to do so as well, and the warden engaging in this practice would be culturally consistent. As for the Thin Man, while he may not share the same torment as his counterparts, he has another that is equally unpleasant to suffer with devastating isolation and loneliness, trapped in a city of entertainment with no way to entertain himself. Though it might seem odd at first for the spoils of nowhere to come at such a high cost to the winners, this starts to make more sense when we consider that each cycle is tied to a specific kind of location, a living structure that exists to consume residents of nowhere. We know, of course, that the Signal Tower is actually a monster of flesh and eyes masquerading as concrete and wood, entertaining the viewers with a variety of truly banger stations before consuming them through their screens, and there's evidence to suggest that the Maw fits this description as well. It exists to entertain the guests with food before consuming them, and in the residence chapter, a large wooden eye can be seen on the wall with black liquid oozing from behind it. At first glance, you could just chalk this up to leeches, but that doesn't really make sense. These creatures are only seen in the dark, moist corners of the Maw and likely wouldn't survive long in a place dry enough to house a library of books. Furthermore, in concept art for the Maw, we can see a great deal of dark liquid also oozing from the bottom of the vessel. Suspicious on its own, the nature of this liquid was solidified by Chapter 3 of the podcast, in which Noon explores the shopping mall and learns it too is actually a creature of flesh and eyes. 
When she tries to escape at the end of the dream, the walls are described as leaking a thick, dark liquid that pools around her feet. And that's not all, for there is another important question to consider here. Who is steering the maw? We never find a control room or see any other indication that the lady is doing this, and while that in itself isn't enough to go on, I think the pattern of the maw says enough. As mentioned earlier, the maw surfaces once per year at the same time but never at the same place according to information from the old Little Nightmares website, and there are an abundance of real-world sea creatures that follow a similar pattern. Take, for example, the box jellyfish. These organisms live in the open ocean, but once per month, at precisely the same phase of the lunar cycle, they rise to the shallows and mate before sinking back into the deep. Just as they synchronize to the chronological cycle of the moon because it is a constant, reflecting the very light that brings life to their world, the entities of nowhere are fed by humanity and thus synchronize to the chronological cycles of their host. The prison is even more overtly shown to be alive, with Noon describing it as a stone giant whose passageways pulse feverishly like living ant tunnels. The prisoners here are given security and order before eventually, presumably, having their bodies and souls consumed in some way, though we can only guess what. Perhaps it has something to do with the room full of glass jars Noon peeks into earlier in the dream. To tie everything together now, I believe that these entities are the eyes Noon sees at the threshold specifically their physical manifestations in nowhere. They are the very foundation of this world, creatures both ancient and incomprehensible, and they have an intimate need for humanity. When Noon first comes across the warden of the prison, she describes her as being the keeper of this stone giant, and I think this term can be applied to the lady and thin man as well. What are they if not keepers of their own giants? Far from being free, these individuals are merely slaves to the system and are kept around only to keep these cosmic entities fed on the trauma and fear of countless children. The Keeper's happiness simply does not matter. The final question I want to address is a simple one. Can the cycle be broken? For instance, would the cycle of the Maw have been broken if Six decided not to go through with consuming the Lady? Unfortunately, I think the answer is no. This wasn't ever really an option. Consider this. Why doesn't the lady go after Six as soon as she breaks the vase? Why didn't she get rid of the oval mirror, even though mirrors hold power over her and are almost certainly how she herself defeated Four? Because the cycle is destined to continue. Six belongs in the lady's quarters, and she will get there one way or another. Upon discovering the first monitoring room deep in the lair, it appears to be where the lady keeps an eye on the inhabitants of the Maw to keep them in line. But eventually it reveals the lady herself in her private quarters, and then finally the small unbroken mirror. There is something greater here than the lady, and this omniscient force shows the viewer exactly what they need to do. For Six, it is to defeat the lady with the mirror, and for the runaway kid, who finds a second monitoring station, it is to enable Six to accomplish this through any means necessary. The cycle just can't be broken so easily. Even if Six was caught before succeeding, the Maw is filled with children for a reason. One of them will eventually do it. This might be why the ferryman brings so many of them to the Maw in the first place. He isn't sure which one is going to become Six, and so he brings as many as he can find. And unfortunately for the lady, she must allow these children to remain in order to keep the engine running with her gnome transfiguring spell. Why else would she keep children on board only to lock them up at the bottom of the ship with plenty of countermeasures to keep them there? It is a cruel irony that the one thing she needs to keep the vessel running to satisfy her hunger is also the one thing that can destroy her, and it would be no surprise to learn she is tormented by anxiety and paranoia as well as shame. This is all hypothetical though, because Six was always going to be the child who succeeded, for the Ma does not exist in a vacuum. It is no secret that the cycles of the Maw and Signal Tower are closely linked, with one leading to the other. Six dropping Mono is what ultimately causes him to become the Thin Man, and what leads her to the Maw. Even the nest is connected, as the yellow raincoat girl saves Six, making it possible for her to escape on the raft and presumably end up in the wilderness where she runs into Mono in the first place. And who knows, it could be that Five also braved the nest and ran into the previous iteration of Mono before arriving on the Maw a generation earlier. This all raises an interesting question. Could every cycle be linked together in one giant super cycle? 
the paths of children well-worn, repeating eternally, the effects of their interactions rippling across the fabric of nowhere and shaping its future. Perhaps these cycles run like neurons through the brain of some incomprehensible being, the Great Red Eye, and to bring down its rotten world would require breaking every single cycle at once. Well, that's all I have for today, but as always, if you enjoyed the theory, then be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more. I would love to hear what you think about it in the comments below, and hope to see you in the next one.